Some people only care about themselves. No one cares about your stupid vacation. Some people treat others poorly. Do we have anarchy? Times, right? There's no. certain things that are right and there's certain it things that are wrong. No. So don't believe what all these foolishness. Everybody Some people only care about the being right. There are Some people don't seem worth the time. But the truth is... Most people are just working to get by. Most people are terrified to reveal their scars. Most people are fighting an invisible battle. Sir, you forgot a bag. Most people are worth the effort because all people are created in the image of God. Where's my pillow? All people carry the glow of the divine. All people matter enough. for God to become one of them. God thinks every person is worthy of love. Imagine if we did too. Let's be a church where everybody's welcome. Nobody's perfect. Anything is possible. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for being here today. We're so glad that we can all come together and worship our Lord Jesus Christ. If you are visiting and this is your first time here at Zion, we just want to send a warm welcome. Uh, thank you so much for choosing Zion to be a worship place this morning. And we hope that you will come back again uh, in the near future. Uh, and those who are worshiping with us online, we just want to welcome you as well, uh, wherever you are. We hope that God uh, is still praised in our little rooms, uh, wherever we are this morning. Uh, let's praise God for that and give thanks to God for all He is doing in our lives. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, let's go ahead and pray and then we'll go ahead and start with our songs for today. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for this wonderful morning. God, we praise you for bringing all of us here safely. God, we thank you for all the things you have done and you are doing in our lives. God, we thank you for our families. We thank you for our neighbors. We thank you for our friends. God, we thank you that we can come together to praise you and worship you. Lord, bless our hearts. Bless each and every one in this place. And our brothers and sisters worshiping with us online. God, we ask that you continue to watch over us. In these difficult times that we are all facing. As a nation. God, we ask that you continue to give us peace and joy. In the midst of all of this. God, let nothing take away our joy and our peace, God. Because we know you are God of joy and peace. You are God of patience. You are God of forgiveness. You are God. No matter what circumstances that we face in life, there's nothing that have ever changed who you are. Season changes. You never change, God. 
Years pass, you never pass. We praise you. We glorify you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may stand and sing with us. Today we have uh, two uh, kind of the old uh, songs. We are thinking about songs that used to bless us back in the days. And uh, so we got two of those uh, this morning. And we hope that you will be blessed by them. God bless you.
as we sing our next song, just want to take you back to the book of Ephesians. The Bible tells us that we were all sinners. We had no hope. And Jesus Christ saw the need. How we were all dying from our sins. When nobody else could come down to save us. But he took the chance and said, it's got to be me. And this morning we're going to sing how mighty our Jesus Christ is. He's a mighty to save. He is a mighty to heal. He's mighty to bring joy and peace. The price that he paid for all of our sins. Think about how many times you were forgiven. Think about sins that God forgave you. And we're just going to use that as an example to forgive our neighbors. To forgive our friends. To forgive our relatives. God forgive us. Jesus forgave our sins. And it's time for us to forgive others. No matter what they have done to us. Think about forgiveness. Hallelujah. God, we ask you to bless us. We ask you to help us forgive one another. God, we ask you to bless us. We ask you to help us forgive those who hurt us, God. Help us to forgive those who spoke bad about us, God. Help us to forgive those who are speaking on our backs, God. Help us to forgive those who don't see the way we see them. Help us to forgive those who speak the language that we don't speak, God. Help us to forgive those who harmed us, God. God, we thank you for the forgiveness of our sins. At the cross, God, the price that you paid so that we can be forgiven. This is the time for us to forgive, for us to forget those who hurt us, those who hurt us, those who harmed us, those who violated everything. Forgive us, God. Forgive us, God. Forgive us, God. God, we know we may see things differently. We may believe different things, God. But there is nothing else that we can compare to your forgiveness. God, help us to forgive those who abused us, God. To see that you, my God, all together worthy, all together worthy, all together wonderful for to. Mighty 
to save God. We thank you for saving us, Lord. We thank you, Jesus. Glory of the risen 
Thank you for the unity. We thank you for the love that we continue to see in this place, God. God, we thank you for all of our faces, blacks and whites and yellow and red, for your glory, God. different tongues, different languages, God, unified to praise you and worship you. We praise you. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people say, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you very much, worship team. Good morning, everyone. It's kind of nice outside. It's a little windy, but it's nice. It's not raining, snowing, or hailing yet, but it's coming, I feel like. Uh, my name's Pastor Robert. Uh, I want to give you an extended warm welcome for those who are watching on the internet here online. Um, before we get started with the announcements, can we go ahead and run a short video? This is uh, about the STARS kids, what we do each year for them.
every year um, for the last seven years, I think it's been since I've been here at Zion, we've did some type of things for the kids. And if we're, I, I don't care if the coronavirus is here or not, we're still doing stuff with the kids. Um, whether they come here or we take the bus to them. But every year we've been able to, Jesus, through Jesus, has been able to give these kids, and I mean 250 kids or plus, some type of presence. And now more than ever, I mean, something positive has got to happen in their life. Um, amen? I mean, so uh, if you can, pray first. And God will pick the people who he needs to give these little kids Christmas presents. One thing that's coming up here that I wanted to talk to you about is the Operation Bethlehem. Jesus didn't have a bed. He had a manger. Remember that? And Jesus wants everybody to have a bed, especially the kids that are sleeping on the floors. So we're doing just like we have year after year. Operation Bethlehem. We're trying to get 75 beds, about 100 bucks a piece. Do the math. Okay, so here's the exciting thing I wanted to talk about. Um, Christmas Eve. Have you ever seen a real live nativity? Real live nativity. I mean, where there's sheep, cows, goats. I want to be a sheep, by the way. That's, I'm going to, I asked Pastor John if I could be one. He said, yeah, I could be. He said, yeah. So anyway, yeah, um, it's fun to watch the kids for the first time going through these nativity scenes or even adults for the first time going through a live nativity scene. I mean, that's something really, really, I've never even thought about something like that until Pastor John thought about it. I don't know if it was him or someone else, but it was always good. But anyway, um, that's all the announcements I'm going to have. Everything in the bulletin, read this bulletin, and I'm, or if you are online, um, I'm sure if you don't have the bulletin you're watching, give us your email address and we'll put you on there. Um, that's all the announcements for now. Let's give Pastor John a warm welcome as he brings the message. Okay. Thank you, Pastor Robert. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, everybody out there in uh, TV land. Good morning, Boaz. Boaz, I got to tell you about that song, you know. Uh, Savior, he can move the mountains. Our God is mighty to save. Can I tell it? Is it okay? Okay, you don't know what I'm going to say. Well, uh, I'm going to tell your story. That's what I'm going to do. Uh, uh, so, you know, uh, we used to sing that song on Wednesday nights, right? And for some reason, it just grabbed a hold of these kids. Do you know what I mean? And so we'd be uh, driving back, you know, wherever they live, we'd drive them home, you know, and the van would just erupt with this song all the way to 15th Street, you know. So then you fast forward 10 years, and uh, some of those kids are 20 years old now, you know. And uh, this summer... Uh, you know, there was, no, there was no camp, right? Camp was shut, COVID, can't go anywhere. And uh, Grace wanted to take her Bible study girls who are 20 years old. And uh, we went, uh, rented a place at uh, Okoboji Bible Camp, you know, a cabin. And we had, I don't know, six, eight girls. And uh, Grace engineered a, a fire for them uh, one night. And she said, and, and now we're going to sing. And I'm like, oh. Because it's like, where's, where's the youth director? You know, where's the guy with the guitar, right? I mean, you know, where's the guy who knows the words? Where's the guy who can sing, you know? And, you know, right away, what did they sing? You know, Savior, he can move the mountains. Our God is mighty to save. And, you know, afterwards, I mean, they're, they're 20 years old. One or two of them are in, you know, college, pursuing higher things. Everybody else is working. They don't come on Wednesday nights because that's what they did when they were kids. And they said, you know, this is our childhood. This is, this is what we remember. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, they're the reason 
that we want to do this youth service, Greater City, on uh, the third Saturday of every month. I mean, I would do it every day if we could, right? But we got to start with what we can start. But it's because, you know, it's been 10 years. I mean, you all were driving vans, you remember, with uh, these little kids in them, and, and they're 20 years old now, you know? It's just amazing. And they're not going anywhere to church. And can I say something that I don't want you to misinterpret or anything like that, but you cannot get them to church on Sunday morning, right? And I think it's that last word that has more to do with it. Do you know what I mean? It's not church. It's morning, you know? And uh, so, you know, we're going to do this on, on Saturday night. Y'all can come, okay? And it counts, it counts. You come Saturday night. You don't have to be here on Sunday morning. We will remember your face, okay? Camera in the lobby will capture it. Uh, it you know, you are, you, are, you are welcome to be here. Uh, uh, talking to Boaz about this, he's doing an excellent job setting it all up. But uh, I am, what I imagine our first night will be like is 20 people up here and two people out here, okay? Because everybody wants to sing. And everybody wants to play. And here's the thing that I just find just hysterical, right? So many of them don't know how. Okay, but I want to, I want, you, can I tell you, did you see Boaz up here last week? Did you see which guitar he was playing? How did he learn bass guitar? He just picked up the other guitar. And then before that, he picked up the keyboard. And then before that, and it's like, how do you do that? This is the most incredible thing I have ever seen. And then I learned it's not about the notes. It's about the sound. Isn't that incredible? And so, uh, you know, it's an amazing thing. And uh, I'm so excited, uh, really, to, to be able to, to do this. I want you to participate. I want you to be a part of it. Because at the end of the day, this is something we're doing together. Amen? Because uh, every last one of you had a part to play to bring us this far. And, you know, if you ever think that COVID is like, you know, destroying everything or whatever, would you just remember this one thing and just say, mm -mm. COVID sparked in so many people a desire to get their spiritual life sorted with God. Traditional means may not satisfy, which means we got to do more and different. But hey, it is our pleasure, and it is our privilege, and uh, I cannot, uh, I cannot wait for this. And uh, so, uh, you know, be in prayer about that too, would you? Because you know, I mean, we gotta, we gotta sound the the gong that reverberates throughout the neighborhood. We gotta summon everybody back. You know, uh, we gotta go find some people, uh, and uh, it, you know, it 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 is, I think, something, and you, you know. I've been wrong so many times, but when it was God's will, I was always right. So here's the thing. Uh, I think it might be the future of the church. And uh, so anyway, uh, be in prayer about that and think about that if you wouldn't mind. Um, from that right on to, uh, so um, is it the end of the world or not? I mean, uh, so many people are like, uh, you know, it is definitely getting really close, right? And, you know, if you want to know where I stand on this at any given time, here is my answer, okay? So if, you, if this kind of talk bothers you, I totally get it. If this kind of talk excites you because, I mean, you know, you see it, okay? The end is a coming or whatever. Here is what I will tell you, regardless of what you think. It's a lot closer than it was, okay? It will happen in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye. And I think that to be a Christian, part of our faith, part of what we confess is that we know he's coming again to judge the quick and the dead, right? So just be ready. And if that's tomorrow, be ready. Go home and pack tonight. And it's a spiritual analogy, okay, right? Uh, don't put it off any longer. 
And if it's not tomorrow, could be next week. And if it's not next week, could be next year. And if it's not next year, could be in a decade. And if it's not in a decade, could be in three decades or 200 years. But here's the thing is, every Christian generation has to be ready. Because you never know. And I mean, you know, people look at stuff. We've got the election drama. Uh, we got pandemic drama. We got wild fires in various places around the earth drama. We've got, uh, uh, what, what do you call it, restlessness. Can't you just feel it? And I mean, I think that's what gets most people. It's just that sense of, oh my goodness gracious, are, you know, are things winding down? And I think that's because we've got creeping pessimism. You know, it's hard to get people optimistic about anything. And here's what I want you to understand, Christian. Okay, our faith, we are very optimistic about the coming of Jesus in glory. Okay? In other words, I, I, and, and I want you to understand that, right? If, if that is not something, that, I'm going to challenge you a little bit, so step back, watch out, right? If that's not something that excites you, if that fills you with dread because you're just having too much fun, May I kindly suggest that maybe you got some stuff you got to get sorted with God. Because if you're enjoying all of this too much and you don't want him to come, okay, I'm just saying that's not right. You know what I mean? Because when he comes, what you believe is that there ain't no cry in there. Why? Because we're going to see the king. Ain't no die in there. Why? Because... We're going to see the king, right? And that's what we're talking about. It's the end of all of that sorrow that we carry, all of that, are you ready for this word, anxiety that we carry? We'll see him face to face, and he'll dry every tear from our eye, and we will be his people, and he will be our God, and he will dwell in our midst. And if you're ever afraid or whatever, doesn't matter, just open up your window and look at him, because he'll be right there in all of his glory. So this idea that he's coming again, hey, this ought to make us happy. It ought to be something that we, if you will, look forward to. Okay, far too many movies, uh, you know, they're focusing on the devastation side of everything, right? And, you know, but that's the way of the world, isn't it? Because the world does not want to quit. The world does not want to end. And then at the end of the day, too, here's the other thing I think that's going on. Hollywood's figured out this uh, eternal truth, I think, and that is we all are fascinated by end-of-the-world movies. Do you know what I mean? I mean, we just can't stop buying tickets to go see end-of-the-world movies. I don't know why that is. We just like to see everything. But I think that we're all, this is my idea. I, take it or leave it. It's a half-baked idea. I think we're all like little kids at the seashore. We love to build sandcastles. Okay, you ever build a sandcastle? I don't, see, I know. That's what I mean. Some of us haven't. Or I want you to imagine you go to the beach and you get the sand wet. So you got to go to the, where the water is. You got to bring it back in a bucket, make the sand wet, and then you can dig it. And then you can push it together and it, it'll stick. And you can make towers and walls and little houses and cathedrals. And you can build your whole world. And then here's the point where everybody gets so excited, so much fun to build it. But what's even more fun? When that tide comes in and knocks it all down again. There's just something in us that's like, yeah, that was really cool. We love to build stuff and we love to see it blow up or what. I don't know why that is, but you know, a, maybe that's a manifestation of, of sin within us. Anyway, uh, the reason I wanted to start with that, okay, uh, and it's a good point, uh, a good place to, to mention this, Zion, 161 years old today, uh, tomorrow, 161 years old tomorrow, uh, happy birthday, Zion. Good thing. Okay. Just want you to know that little group of German-speaking people that started Zion, uh, downtown Des Moines, right, 1859, uh, uh, they, had, uh, they, they thought Jesus was coming soon, too. Okay? So we're, we're all in one accord on this, going generation to generation. Also, I'll just throw this in. It's a cheap shot, but, you know, that's who I am. What can I... Uh, I can't help myself. Uh, tomorrow, my mother, 85 years old. Isn't that something? That's, uh, that's a beautiful thing for her. 
All right, so uh, I want to read from you, or I want to read from you. I want to read to you 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 7. And then Matthew uh, chapter 24, uh, verse uh, 45 and following. So first, uh, 1 Peter 4, 7. The end of all things is at hand. Okay, and this is Peter, right? This is, uh, uh, you know, number one disciple, if you will, right? First pope, all that stuff, you remember him. Denied Jesus three times, got restored. The end of all things is at hand. Therefore, you ready? Be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. Okay, if the end of all things is near, what does a Christian, how does a Christian respond? He responds in prayer, and in order to pray well, you've got to be self-controlled and sober-minded. Does that make sense? How does a Christian face drama? Because I'll tell you something, there's, a, there's drama. Have you ever read what Jesus said about the end? He said, oh, well, you'll know it because there's going to be all this drama. That's what he says. And there'll be wars and rumors of wars and famines, and kingdom will rise against kingdom and nation against nation, and, you know, this and that and all the rest of that. Drama. It's going to be all over the place. All right? But, you know, don't worry yourself. Just be self-controlled, sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. Then... Uh, I want to take you to Matthew 24, a little bit of a parable here, verse 45. Jesus says, Who then is the faithful and wise servant whom his master has set over his household to give them their food, that is the people in the household, their food at the proper time? Blessed is that servant whom his master will find in doing so when he comes. In other words, blessed are you Christians, servants of the Most High God, when he comes back and finds you doing what you're supposed to be doing. Uh, Truly I say to you, he, the master, will set him, the servant, that's you, over all his possessions. But if that wicked servant says to himself, my master is delayed and begins to beat his fellow servants and eats and drinks with drunkards, the master of that servant will come on a day when he does not expect him. Oh, why? Because it's the end. You can't really, uh, you can anticipate it, but you can't chart it. And at an hour that he does not know and will cut him to pieces, oh, and put them with the hypocrites in that place where they will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Okay? So what does that mean? Well, you don't know the hour of the night that the master's coming home. Amen? So keep his house in order, would you? And how do you do that? Well, you'd be self-controlled and sober-minded and pray. That's what we got to do. All right? So uh, when you forget about God, and this happens a lot, uh, when God seems even far away. You know, sometimes we, you go read the Old Testament and what was happening in ancient Israel, you know, they were doing naughty things and they, you know, they didn't believe that God was going to catch them up in it. Why? He wasn't watching. Great theological uh, insight that they had, right? Well, God, God isn't watching. And so we can get away with all this idol worship and we can get away with, uh, you know, uh, throwing widows out of their houses and, you know, uh, uh, sacrificing children and doing all this stuff we've been doing because God's far away. He's not watching us right now. And see, I think as a way sometimes, you know, a lot of our world looks at God if they think about him at all. There is a temptation in those cases when God is far away or when we think he's not watching to abandon our faith, to abandon self-control, our duty, our obedience to God like that wicked servant. And we start doing what we want to do. And what do we want to do? We want to please ourselves. And how do we please ourselves? Well, we beat anybody who stands in our way and we eat and drink with drunkards because it makes us happy. And that's what we do. Uh, I want you to think about this. Uh, You have to choose either your way or my way or his way. And that's the only choices that we've got. So stoplight this morning at 5 a.m., Lower Beaver and Madison Avenue, and there's nothing coming because everybody is safely tucked into bed. And the light, my direction, is red got pretty good visibility on it, can see, you know, both directions or whatever. There's nothing there. Why stop? Why not just jet yourself through? Why go through the motion of waiting 45 seconds for the light to turn? 
Mm. Because it's the wrong thing to do. And you and I need to focus on doing the right kinds of things. Because here's the thing. Apply it to your life. You are who you are best when no one's watching. When it's just you and God. Isn't that true? It's what you do when no one's watching that really is the window into who you are. You know, uh, so many people behave for the cameras. So many people behave, you know, uh, they want the, the world to see them doing good things. Uh, but then when the cameras go away or when no one's watching, you get up to no good. That's not self-control. That's not a life that's pursuing virtue. Uh, you know, virtue, character, if you will, uh, it's real. It isn't a performance it's not for when the cameras are watching. It's about a habitual way of living. It's the essence of who you are. So why is the pursuit of virtue or good character or righteousness important? Well, I think in a spiritual or in an eternal sense, here it is. Number one, it's how God commands us to live. He wants us to live virtuously. I will not give you the 400 uh, uh, verses that I can enter into evidence on that, but I'll just quote a few, right? Be holy as I, the Lord your God, am holy. You are a nation of priests. You are a holy temple, a habitation for the Most High. That's what he desires. You, uh, number two, are a reflection of God. And what does that mean? Uh, that you should aid him uh, and not detract in the mission of God. In other words, you are his appointed representative, so live virtuously because he is. You are his ambassadors. That's what he calls us, his ambassadors. Now, here's the funny thing, right? An ambassador is a civil servant. What happens if the civil servants don't do what the head of the government wants them to do? Well, we've seen it. Chaos, pandemonium, finger-pointing, no righteousness. It's not good. And we are his servants. And the third thing that I'd say is, look, spiritually, eternally, why do you want to pursue a life of uh, virtue? Well, here, uh, because there's judgment. And, you know, I just gave you the words of Jesus. He's coming back. What's he going to find you doing? Living virtuously, like you're supposed to? Or are you doing what you want to do? what we want to do, what I want to do. There's also the practical side. It's better for everyone if we pursue the good. Would you agree with that? There's the good and there's the bad, right? If we all pursue the good, everybody benefits. If we all pursue the bad, guess what? It's bad. If half of us do each of the half, what is it? It's a terrible struggle. Second thing I'd say practically about pursuing a life of virtue, it establishes standards. We need to know what's good and what's bad. And we need to agree on what's good and what's bad because when we don't, drama. Endless hours of going around and around and around and around. How were we able to make so much progress? I don't care what people say. Uh, human beings... Uh, we, we've continued to butcher people, and in the end, I don't suppose we're any better, but look at the progress, uh, vaccines, stuff like that. How did we get that way? We had an agreed-upon sense about what was right and what was wrong, and most of it was based on the gospel. We understood from God what was right and what was wrong, and it benefited everybody all over the world. Third thing, it's better for our society to pursue uh, good rather than evil or uh, self-indulgence. In other words, it makes everything better. And finally, it's better for our families. It's better for our relationships. And I guess, finally, point two, right? Uh, here's the thing. If we don't pursue virtue, and virtue has to do is self-control is a virtue personal responsibility. If you don't pursue that, then freedom loses its meaning and will lose our freedom. 
So how do you pursue virtue? Well, number one, you have to find a virtuous teacher. Anybody know one? Give you a hint, we're in his house, right? I mean, okay, sorry, was that, was that a cheap shot? I don't know, right? Okay, how about this? Uh, uh, you, you have to find a good teacher to tell you what's good because you need content. Every course needs content, okay? So who is the most virtuous teacher of all? Ah, there he is, okay? So wouldn't you want to learn from the best? And then, uh, you know, uh, here's another thing that I would say when it comes to a virtue like self-control. I think Jesus is probably the most self-controlled person I have ever met because he did have that ability to call in those legions of angels and, you know, kind of put an end to all of that torment and all the rest. And did he? No. Why? Because he kept it together. Because in the end, his love of the Father and of the mission of God is greater. His love for God us wins out then you got to commit time why because you have to study and then you got to spend some time with your teacher speaking to him uh before you check out we call it prayer but what if we just called it speaking to the teacher okay excuse me i gotta go spend some time speaking to the teacher because i don't know how to solve this issue or whatever it's what you do at work you'd walk down the office or go over to the next cube or you know go over to the next uh, uh place and 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 you you find out from somebody what it is that you're supposed to do and then I think the, 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 uh, there's another part in this. It's a part that the world doesn't understand. And that is that as a part of this process of entering into this relationship with a teacher, something happens to you. Okay, are you ready for this one? This is the change that only he can bring about. And it's the change in our hearts. See, he does a little heart surgery and he takes our heart of flesh, our heart of sin, and he just kind of grabs it and wrings it out and puts back in a heart full of love for him and for his people. And see, without that, none of the rest of this stuff works. That, I think, is the single greatest thing and, and the part that, I don't know, sometimes we're just embarrassed, I think, maybe sometimes to talk about. But, you know, Jesus tells us, look, here's the thing. Uh, what comes out of your life comes out of your heart, comes out from the inside. How do you make changes on the inside? Well, only he can. And then I think the, the, the other part of it that I would put into this is you, you got to put it into practice. We can't just go and be with the teacher and study and, you know, let that be enough and never put it into practice, never put it to the test because, here's the thing, how do you put it into practice? You have to live it. Uh, and uh, I've got this great quote from Aristotle that I'd love to share with you, but, I, uh, you know, I simply can't uh, uh, because there's just not enough time. But I will tell you about a friend of Aristotle's. His name was Demosthenes. And for those of you who like Kojak, Demosthenes, he's the bigger Greek guy. I mean, that's, that was his stage name. Isn't that great? Demosthenes wanted to be a great orator, right? He wanted to give speeches. He wanted to be, you know, a noble philosopher, ancient Greece. But he had a couple of problems. Uh, number one, he was inarticulate. It meant... Uh, he didn't know how to speak well. And number two, he had a bit of a stammer. And so he had problems with his pronunciation. So you know what Demosthenes did in pursuit of his goal? He put pebbles in his mouth until he could speak in such a way that people could understand him with pebbles in his mouth. And remarkably, when he removed the pebbles, he had a beautiful voice. And he was able to articulate his sentences and his thoughts. He had this other thing. He wanted to, you know, have his voice heard. And so what he did was he would recite verses and other people's speeches while he would run up and down the stairs. And then Demosthenes had a peculiar thing, too. Uh, he had difficulty focusing on his studies. Sound familiar? And again, I'm going to give this to all you people at home uh, with kids uh, who have difficulty focusing on their studies and everything. This is a free tip from Demosthenes, okay? What you do to get people to study that Demosthenes found out for two or three months at a time, 
solid study, not being uh, confused by what's going on in the outside world, you shave half their head. Because then they're embarrassed to go out. And they'll focus more on their studies. That's what Demosthenes did. He said, you know, I just have a great deal of temptation. I'd rather go out. I don't want to study these manuscripts or whatever. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to shave half my head. And uh, then it's going to take a lot of time to grow back, two or three months, and then I'll do this. George Washington. George Washington, amazing man of self-control. Father of our country. Why did he get to be our father of our country? Because he really kept it together under very difficult circumstances. Did you ever consider about Valley Forge? Here were all these colonial governors who had the money he needed to buy stuff for his army, feed his troops, have them not freeze to death. And they were playing games. And, you know, I don't know how you would be. I fight the temptation to get a big stick and go visit some of them. Do you know what I mean? And, and tell them exactly how I feel about my troops starving. He didn't. He wrote them lovely letters telling them what a great job they were doing and thanking them for their help in advance. He was an incredible man. How did he manage to keep that much self-control? Well, you see, the thing was that he would write out, uh, there was this book he had, Rules of Civility in Conversation Amongst Men, and as a child, he wrote it over and over again in his lesson book. And it was, uh, I think, 110 rules. And he wrote them out until he memorized them, until they became a part of who he was. Imagine doing this with Scripture. Taking the Sermon on the Mount, for instance, and just writing it out until it became a part of who you are. Or, here's a novel idea, what if you memorized it? Talking about immersing yourself in the scripture, just letting it get in and nourish you. Number five on Washington's list, 110 thing, be no flatterer, neither play with anyone who delights not to be played with. I think it's a good idea, I mean, really. Strive not with your superiors in argument, but always submit your judgment to others with modesty. I think it's true for the Christian virtues, too, we must practice. And what does that mean? If you want to be an honest person, stop lying. I mean, I know it sounds ridiculous, right? But what if you made this deal with yourself that you just weren't going to do it anymore? How do I look, dear? Okay, I mean, and it starts there, right? Right? Uh, I mean, what's, what's the thing that you, you know, because always we justify our lives. You can't handle the truth, right? What if you started to let people handle that truth and started to give up that much control so that you would be an honest person? It has to happen. What about self-control? Uh, you have to practice, uh, you know, keeping yourself. I mean, one of the things uh, for me, and this has been, self-control is very difficult. And, 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 and part of it is, you, you know, my face. It, it, I, yeah, play cards with me and you can take me for everything I've got if, uh, you know, if, uh, if, if we played for money. Because everything crosses across my face. It's like the great desolation of Wyoming. You can see every cloud in the sky reflected on my face. For, uh, what, the last five years? You know, I've had this pain thing, and I grimace. Walking across the parking lot, people stop and say, why are you so angry? And it's like, I'm not angry. It just hurts. But how do you, how do, you do that? I have to retrain my face. Pain's better. I have, to, I have to, like, recover my smile muscles or something like that, right? It's everywhere. Otherwise, I just look like I'm just like ready to hit somebody, haul off and slug them or something. You know, I got this thing where um, I, can't, I can't stop it. Uh, in intense moments, my hands do this. I've had it since I was a small child. And I don't know why. It's just intense stuff just gets me. And I can't stop flapping. And it frightens people. Because a lot of times, I don't even know I'm doing it. Can you believe that? I mean, how spooky is that? I always wonder sometimes when I'm sitting in a chair all alone or something like that, you know, and somebody comes into the room or something, and then they, they go away in a hurry or something. I, it's like, did I say something I didn't even know? Do, do you know what I mean? I mean, if I can't control this, what else can I control? Oh, my word. But you see, it's kind of like sin. 
a lot of times we just can't control. And, uh, you know, we have to give it over to God. Because he's the only one who can control. He's the only one who can heal us. He's the only one who can help us get better. But we have to practice. And I think, too, knowing Jesus a little bit, you have to want to get better. So we all need to work on our self-control, especially these days. Why? Because by word, things are out of control. Amen? So we gotta, can't control that. Got to control this. Amen? And so we ask God to help and guide us. So I'm over time, and little fluttering bells, that was great. It was like Boaz texting me, telling me, excuse me, we have another service, and you're already five minutes over, and, uh, you know, so on and so on, but you'd owed me five minutes from last time. So uh, anyway, that's, that's what we got. Would you uh, stand, and let's uh, pray together the words uh, that Jesus taught us to pray. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you his peace. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Go in peace. Serve the Lord. All right. Thank you.